Hello and welcome to a special edition of The Hot Seat to discuss the political situation in Greece in light of the recent elections. With me are two doctors here at the LSE, Dr Daphne Halikopoulou and Dr Nikitas Konstantinidis. Why is this election so important? Okay, yeah, so the, um, the election of the 6th of May is one of the most important elections that has taken place in Greece uh, since the uh, Metapolitics, the restoration of the democratic regime in 1974. I'd say that it, one of the most important features of this election is the defragmentation of the party system. So a previously very strong two-party system that produced strong majority governments for either the centre-right New Democracy Party or the centre-left PASOK Party has now completely crumbled with uh, New Democracy coming first with 18.8% of the vote, that's very small, and PASOK barely getting a 13% of the vote. Uh, that left it, I believe, with uh, 41 seats in Parliament uh, losing 120 seats from its previous um, a representation in 2009. Their respective vote shares added up to less than yeah. uh, half of what they got in 2009 and so you know the, 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 what happened in a matter of like three years is, is amazing. It's a uh, complete like uh, overturn of the of the entrenched two-party system. So. Absolutely, I mean we're talking about two parties that together uh, used to occupy about 80% or 75% of the seats in Parliament uh, and together they concentrated again over 70% of the votes cast and now they barely made uh, as you said 35 so it's it's quite a groundbreaking result so and uh, yeah another feature of, of the election that is groundbreaking is the support for anti-establishment politics so the election witnessed the both the rise of the far left so for example Syriza the coalition of the radical left got uh, I believe uh, 16 point uh, seven or eight percent of the votes cast, but also we saw the uh, independent Greeks, a radical right party offshoot of New Democracy with 10 percent of the vote and 33 seats, and of course the most worrying result was the rise of the Golden Dawn, an extreme uh, right uh, Nazi party that got 6.97 percent of the vote and gained 21 seats in a parliament of 300. Um, I guess what I would add to this is, I mean, I perfectly I agree 100% with Daphne in what she said. Um, it's the actual party labels are not as clear cut, uh, cut as we uh, we would think they are. For example, Syriza is, I mean, of course, some people, yeah, uh, have been uh, sort of uh, termed it as a sort of radical leftist party. Um, but at the end of the day, it's so it's a pre-electoral coalition party. It's a coalition of left-wing movements. So you have there, you have it's a, a compilation of uh, of uh, green ecologists. Uh, we have uh, communists in there. We have social democrats. We have like a number of different sort of uh, factions that sort of came together. And, and 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 the funny thing about this party is that I'm sure they did not really expect to to reach. Um, to get such a high vote share, so they were not basically ready to govern, right? They were not. So, so the question is, how will they be able to transform themselves from um, from a protest sort of opposition party uh, to a party that is ready to take part in, in government? So, the deep the deep question of the of these elections, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a very simple question. It's the question of governability. So, how will the the country be governed from now on, given that the sort of um, the two-party system has collapsed. And, and of course, some people will jump to, you know, the, it's easy to sort of uh, to get to, to, to um, reach like a number of different interpretations of, of uh, these elections. There are so many different contradictions that sort of uh, were evident. So, for example, uh, a majority of people voted for parties that were against the memorandum, right? So these sort of very uh, strict fiscal conditionality imposed from from uh, other European capitals. Uh, but then again, uh, a majority of people voted in favor of the bailout agreement, right? So people, we need the money, right? And people did recognize that fact. And plus a number of people, and a pretty big majority at that, were uh, voting in favor of, of staying in the Eurozone. So there's a number of different contradiction, contradictory sort of messages that came out of these elections. How does this election differ from past elections in Greece? I would say that what characterized another feature of this election what characterized this election is this cleavage as you were mentioning earlier between the pro memorandum of understanding forces and the anti memorandum of understanding forces so what determined the vote to a great extent was 
is, is this party going to renegotiate the memorandum of understanding? What is going to happen to the austerity measures that have been going on in Greece and have, have had significant um, impact on, on people's financial situation? Uh, and also, how are we going to do that? So I, I, I would completely agree with you that the, the problem is that many people voted um, in favour of parties that are against the memorandum of understanding. But to what extent this can be realistic policy is, is, is another issue. So Syriza, for example, is saying that they are against the memorandum of understanding and they're saying that they would like to renegotiate or I believe even cancel the terms and conditions of the memorandum, but they still want Greece to remain as part of the Eurozone. Now, how this will uh, pan out in practice remains to be seen and I, I think this is quite quite impossible really so not only does the election differ in terms of what we discussed before the defragmentation of the party system the rise of anti-establishment politics the introduction in parliament of a, an extreme right-wing party alongside other um, far-right uh, parties and, and center-right parties but also uh, this dichotomy between the pro and anti memorandum of understanding politics and what does this now mean for uh, Greece in the future? What, what is at stake is Greece's future both in the Eurozone and the European Union? I actually voted for the first time in my life uh, in these elections uh, for the simple fact that, that the Greek political system does not, electoral system does not allow for uh, a postal vote, um, which is sort of an interesting uh, issue in itself. Um, and of course, I, I did sense that there was going to be sort of you know a big sort of electoral shift, and and, and the stakes of these elections were extremely high, uh, obviously. Um, what seemed to happen is that the actual composition of the electorate changed radically uh, in the past uh, sort of three four years of austerity, even going back to uh, 2008 when uh, Greece experienced its first year of, of negative growth. Um, the cleavages are not as clear-cut as they used to be, right? Uh, you have, for one, so on one hand, uh, you have young people voting against all people. Um, you have uh, public sector employees voting against uh, private sector employees. Uh, you have uh, salaried voters against uh, property voters. Um, and, uh, you know, a number of, of other different cleavages are sort of uh, gave shape to this very, very complicated uh, electoral outcome uh, and this sort of fragmentation and factionalization of the, of the political system, which started even before the election, right, simply by uh, the, the number of parties that actually contested these elections and uh, the, the, the number of, of, of uh, splits and splinters that took place in the, in the political system, yeah. right. That's a, that's, and I would, I would like to add to this that actually that now that you mention it, for all the talk about you know, the rise of the small parties, uh, it's also interesting to note that most of these parties are actually new and they are offshoots of the main parties. Even in the, the, you know, in, in the uh, combination of some of the smaller parties, we have many people who left PASOK, who left New Democracy and went to these new parties. So this sort of adds to the disillusionment uh, that voters have in the political system. So we're voting for another party, yes, but really, is it going to make any change if the, the members of this new party are actually just members of, of other parties that have just left and, and gone to these ones? So, and I would add to this that you know, I, I, I would you know, I wouldn't be ready to sort of interpret this uh, result as a clear-cut sort of outright protest vote, right? Uh, the picture is much more complicated than that, and and uh, the fact that there are so many different parties uh, made their vote, the voters' choice, much uh, harder, much more complicated. People were very confused. I mean, they really they didn't know uh, what party actually. Um, would best sort of protect uh, their interests or represent their their um, their ideology. Um, so in that sense, I, I, that me uses the word disillusionment. I would use the word frustration. Right? There was deep, uh, deep rooted frustration uh, this time around, and it was very evident by you know yeah, it was very evident in the outcome. Uh, of the vote, it was also evident beforehand, right, with a number of uh, with with the, with the uh, rise in social unrest, civil disobedience, uh, all these different sort of facets of um, sort of kind of uh, a political system that is sort of misaligned with public opinion and with uh, how people experience their the, the the hardships of their daily lives. Yeah.
Absolutely. And to, to this, I would, sorry, I would add as well that this is why populism is another feature of the election. This is why populism was so successful. Uh, something interesting we were saying, talking about earlier, was that actually certain uh, non-populist, perhaps uh, liberal parties that run for election didn't even make the 3% threshold and remained out of parliament. So we did see many populist parties in parliament and many non-populist parties not even gaining uh, political representation at all. And, and the, under, the other interesting fact about this is that the sum total of parties that stayed out of parliament, right, that did not make it over past the, the 3% uh, threshold, uh, added up to more than the, the, the sum total of the first party of, of New Democracy. So it was, I think, uh, 20 uh, to 19%. Um, so, you know, some others would argue that there's a deep sort of uh, democratic deficit mm -hmm. that's sort of uh, ingrained in these elections. Right? Um, has serious politics been replaced by opportunism? Populism and opposition. This is my yeah. The word populism has been flo you know, floated around like quite a bit, and this is my interpretation of what populism means at this point in time. Um, most of the debate that took place in the elections took place over issues that, such as let's say immigration, right, debt restructuring, uh, unemployment, right. So these are real sort of uh, issues of of, of uh, daily life, right, but. These are issues that Greece alone cannot address, right, as a, as a sovereign nation state. Um, I mean, you know, Danny Roderick talks a lot about this sort of trilemma, right, between uh, global financial integration, democracy, and national sovereignty. Something has to give. You cannot have all three together at the same time. Um, so my interpretation of populism in this case is a, it's, it's a it's sort of deep sort of, sort of frustration over how to deal with such issues where basically you need others to help, right? You need the help of, of your uh, European partners. Uh, you need to, to sort of reach some common agreements uh, at the sort of supranational level. And if you look at the platforms, right, the platforms of most of these so-called populist parties, um, they make a lot of dubious sort of assumptions about you know the outcomes of some sort of supranational uh, negotiations that would take place. But of course, you cannot really uh, base or your your entire sort of uh, political campaign on what other countries will do in response to uh, to the vote in this case. Right? In my opinion, uh, the Greek electorate is faced by a catch twenty two situation. Um, they can either vote for one of the two main parties that are mainstream and are pro-European and have respectable ideologies on the one hand, but have been so closely associated with clientelism, corruption and favoritism that in effect they've rendered themselves unelectable. Or they could vote for one of the radical parties that may not be as closely associated with clientelism and favoritism, but are so radical and extreme in some cases that could actually be playing dangerous games with Greece's future, both in the Eurozone and the European Union. And unfortunately, I think it is this catch-22 that defines the Greek choice at the moment. And, you know, we're having new elections again in, I believe it's been announced, this June 17th. And uh, the practice of this uh, remains to, to be seen then. Well, just to play devil's advocate, though, uh, one could also argue that it's the the the, uh, the the extreme sort of radical parties that were the more responsible in these in this election because in this election simply because their 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 platform and their agenda was purely based on unilateral kind of policies, right? So uh, exiting the euro, uh, exiting the, uh, the European Union as a whole, right? So that's what both the Goldman's own party. Um, advocated as well as the uh, the Communist Party. So in that sense, you know, the two extremes of the political spectrum came, you know, were joined up in, in that sense. So whereas the mainstream sort of pro-European parties are still not uh, entirely sure, you know, what the way forward is. My sort of, I guess, uh, short-term prediction about especially these next elections is we are going to have a government. I mean, uh, the things we, we the, these elections took place. Um, it had been. It was the first uh, round of elections that took place uh, uh, once the austerity measures started uh, coming into effect. So parties needed to know where they stand in terms of their electoral support. But now, of course, the the, the specter of ungovernability is going to force them into some. Uh, sort of coalition, some form of coalition or another. But this type of coalition is going to be very uneasy, right? And. 
uh, I am pessimistic in the sense that they will not have a strong enough mandate and they will not be able to converge to um, a very sort of compact sort of common platform. Um, we're still going through a period of modeling through and modeling through is taking place both at the domestic level in Greece but also at the European level in terms of like European wide measures that could sort of change the rules of the game and restabilize the political system in Greece. Any last but, predictions for the future? Yeah sure but um, the latest uh, polls after the the election on the 6th of May indicate that Syriza will be the first party with approximately I believe 27.7 percent of, of the vote uh, where would that leave a coalition? This would put Syriza as the first party. It would grant it the 50 bonus seats uh, that the electoral system gives the, the, the first party. It wouldn't give it a strong majority, but it would mean that it would have a very big say in calling the shots of whatever coalition is formed. And I wonder what that would mean if uh, Alexis Tsipras is going to continue his very firm line uh, that wants to renegotiate or even cancel the terms and conditions of the Memorandum of Understanding and how that will go down uh, with, uh, with the European Union and with Germany. I think I've already seen signs of uh, Tsipras and his party actually softening the rhetoric on, on what they want to do with the memorandum and on their, what kind of stance they want to assume in, their, in uh, the sort of uh, European level negotiations. Um, and it's an interesting thing you say about the 50%, the 50 seat bonus that goes to the first party, it actually goes to uh, any type of movement that, is actually, that has, been, has been recognized as a, as a party, right? Uh, whereas Syriza, at this point in time is considered a coalition. So I'm not 100% yeah, sure unclear. that they will actually it's go unclear. ahead and sort of declare themselves as a party because that will also sort of, um, you know, uh, destabilize the internal sort of balance, right? And the internal configuration of powers within their sort of coalition of different sort of very heterogeneous kind of movements. So, um, I'm, so, I'm hopeful that even if Syriza takes part in a future uh, coalition government, they uh, will not sort of uh, you know, uh, try to resort to extremes and implement the former more sort of radical rhetoric. I mean, it's, it, we're, it's, they're undergoing a very sort of gradual process of transformation from a protest party to a party, a responsible party of government. And, and hopefully, can I just add one small point to this, which is that, you know, hopefully they will be willing to enter a coalition the second time around because the very reason that a coalition government wasn't formed this time is because Syriza completely, utterly, totally rejected to join any government that consists of any mm -hmm. pro-memorandum of understanding a political force or party. So the, 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 the question to which extent will he, will Alexis Tsipras now be willing to join such a coalition I think is, remains to be seen. Thank you very much. You're off the hot seat. <laughs>